Welcome to the Founder Video Podcast, an interview series bringing you the latest and greatest info on B2B marketing, revenue operations, and go-to-market strategy from respected experts. Here is your host, Will Martin. All right, so we are here for our 13th episode of the Founder Video Podcast. Today we have with us Canberg Becker, uh, head of growth at Hockey Stack, a YC-backed company uh, revolutionizing the B2B attribution space that has been uh, probably uh, conquering most of uh, listeners' LinkedIn feeds, right? And um, yeah, I mean, the the well, first of all, welcome, welcome to the podcast, and appreciate you accepting the invite, man. Hi, Will. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. And you know, the first question that I had for you, because you've been uh, four times growth leader in B two B SaaS and have had more than six positions in growth at this point throughout your career. And, you know, growth is usually this term that a lot of people struggle defining and like actually figuring out like what, what is, what does someone in growth do, right? Because it it really depends. And so throughout those six roles that you've had in growth throughout your career, what has been the most important learning that you've made uh, regarding, regarding this area? Well, I think uh, you're 100% right because everyone has a different definition for growth. Everyone uh, thinks growth as a different thing. And to be fair, I don't even know how to describe growth either. Like when people ask me what I do, especially people who are not in tech, uh, I basically say I'm a management consultant. Uh, I'm an in-house management consultant because growth, even though some companies consider growth as Pure marketing, I think it is more than that. Uh, Growth needs to take care of from the first touch, like from the uh, acquisition part up until the retention part, referral part, uh, the entire journey. And for me, like my first boss, uh, my first manager, I used to resemble growth as like a baking powder. Uh, Baking powder alone, it means nothing. You cannot eat it. You cannot uh, drink it. You shouldn't snort it. Uh, and uh, if you have good ingredients, like if you have milk, if you have eggs, you can actually uh, bake a great cake. So growth is that baking powder. Alone, it means nothing. And growth m- m- needs to make sure that sales, marketing, product, customer success needs to uh, be working uh, in the most efficient way and working in a perfect harmony. And uh, the thing that I learned uh, in my whole ex- experiences would be Data never lies. Like, I think I would go with data. Like, everyone has different opinions. Everyone thinks uh, their idea is the best idea. Uh, But if you cannot back back up that idea with data, uh, it is not a good idea. Obviously, there are some cases that if you don't have any historical data, if you don't have anything, you have to trust your gut. Uh, But even in order to trust that gut, you have to first understand that there is no data. Like, Everything starts from data and you need to reverse engineer what you have to find out the answer. 100%. And to follow up on that, um, you know, data never lies, but a lot of times the data is not collected in the right way or the data, it's, you know, not reflecting what we would like to see, especially, I mean, you guys have been building a tool that I think has helped a lot of marketers overcome this problem of how to get the right data so that we get the the full story and not only the full story, but the right one, right? Because natu- you know, nowadays attribution is one of the most complex areas in B2B uh, given how much the buyer's journey has changed. So, you know, if someone, especially someone that doesn't come from tech maybe, right? That it's hasn't learned all of the wrong principles of attribution. <laughs> How would you explain to them the, in, in, in what, what is the right way to collect data? So I think yeah, the reason that I love hockey stick was this, like I bought hockey stick three years ago as one of their first customers. Uh, and then two years ago, I went to Cognizant. Uh, and the first tool I got was Hockey Stack, and I was their first enterprise customer with uh, Cognizant. Uh, and now I'm working at Hockey Stack because of this. Like the product, they built the product around my needs. They understood what I needed. They understood what was missing at Deep Crawl, what was missing at Cognizant, and they built everything uh, for me to understand the data clearly. Uh, and yeah, Hockey Stack now solves this problem in a uh, huge way but yeah if 
there's someone who doesn't uh, have a tech background, who doesn't have the data background, number background. The way I would explain this to them is, okay, uh, you might be, okay, you know what? Uh, let me try this one. Someone uh, is leaving eggs in your doorstep every day. Uh, and you get used to having these eggs and you are making omelet uh, in every breakfast and uh, you get five eggs every day. But some t sometimes uh, you get three eggs, sometimes you get one egg, but you have no idea how this is happening uh, because you have no idea who is bringing those eggs in the first place. And attribution basically tells you who is bringing those eggs, at what time those eggs are coming, and if those eggs will keep coming in the future, and if there's any uh, thing, like any outside uh, thing that impacts the deliverability of those eggs. And if you can do anything to make uh, more eggs to come, or if you, can if you can do anything to prevent less eggs to come. So we are making sure that you are making a great omelette. Love that. That's a great analogy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> a great way to put it. Um, you mentioned Cognizant. Uh, you were Cognizant before. Um, and you grew the revenue by 2.6 times in 18 months, right? Yep. How? I know this is a super general question. There's a bunch of nuance, but how, right? <laughs> like, what were the main levers, I guess? Yeah, like, obviously, uh, I wasn't uh, the only person. I worked in a great team. And to be fair, Cognizant was one of those few companies where sales and marketing were actually working in a harmony. Uh, it has been a really interesting journey because uh, before that, I haven't seen anything like that. Uh, and with Cognizant, I think there were a few things. Uh, the brand awareness was amazing. And to be fair, like, we were encouraged by to invest in brand. Uh, and the whole company mindset was about creating the demand first and then capturing it later. So like I had no pressure in generating a pipeline right away. Like uh, as soon as I joined the pipeline at the end of the quarter, as soon as, as long as I hit my targets, that was all right. So it gave me the flexibility to experiment things in the beginning of quarters. And even if uh, those experiments didn't work and actually there were so many experiments that didn't work, the ones that did work help us to uh, increase the revenue so much. And like we, once I joined, uh, let's say my monthly budget was like 1x. Uh, by the time uh, my first year was over, it was like uh, 2x. And even though with 2x budget and my targets were 2x higher, we still kept uh, the pipeline return investment the same, the revenue return investment the same. And obviously, uh, the brand awareness uh, has been a huge part of it, but also we started using Hockey Stack. And uh, literally, uh, that, that was the main reason I joined Hockey Stack uh, in the first place. Like, uh, I became their power user. I was seeing everything that I wasn't able to see before. For example, when I joined, Cognizant was already doing demand gen. Uh, and the demand gen, the, mind, the demand gen mindset was more like, let's spend this money on brand. And if we see an increase in organic pipeline, it means that uh, this is working. But we had no idea which campaign was working, which channel was working, because the whole attribution was about first such and last such. And obviously Google and LinkedIn retargeting campaigns seem to be the best camp best performing campaigns and all of those brand campaigns they were not uh, in the pipeline so they were like okay we are spending this one on pipeline it must be working uh, but with hockey stick we were able to understand which campaigns were actually working and which campaigns were not working which persona has been bringing better pipeline and which target markets we could actually expand more and which uh, target markets we could decrease our budget so like within the first, I think, 90 days at Cognizant, I was able to increase the pipeline to investment by like more than 30%. And all I did was to understand what was working and what was not working. And uh, to be fair, it was not because I joined and because uh, I joined, I was able to do that. It was because of the tool. Like if probably they had the tool before, they could have done it uh, without needing me. But back then, uh, to be fair, that feature of Hockey Stake launched uh, recently, like there was no other tool that was able to do that. And I just got lucky because I got the right tool at the right time. Uh, and when I present that data, like when I uh, present that data and say, this is what I was seeing, nobody ever said me no, like everyone encouraged me to test. Everyone was like, okay, you are the expert here and we are going to listen whatever you say. 
Uh, and I got a bit lucky because I never fucked up, but if I fucked up, that would be a huge problem. Uh, but yeah, everything worked. And uh, there was a huge, uh, like a, they, nobody ever said no to me. Like they were like, okay, you are here. You are here to lead the paid and we are going to be following whatever you say. Interesting. So basically, you managed to grow or helping grow Cognizant thanks to Hockey Stack. Reason why you you started working with Hockey Stack. Uh, tell me more about. I mean, I know the tool in and out. I've done the interactive demo countless times already. And 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 but like you know, there, I'm sure there's a lot of people that still don't know. So what does Hockey Stack do? How is it changing the attribution game? How was it before? How is it now with Hockey Stack? What are the most popular use cases or the most useful that you have seen? Uh, in that that you have used yourself, um, and why do you think it's such a great product? Yeah, yeah. Like it all started with, and I'm trying to stay away from CS pitching. I'm literally going to be talking about my genuine experience with Hockey Stack. Uh, and yeah, like as I said, I have been using Hockey Stack for the last three years, and when I started using it, it was an attribution tool. Like we were seeing the customer journey, we were seeing who we were visiting the website, and last year uh, they launched a new feature where uh, they connected uh, into LinkedIn's API, and we were able to see uh, the ad impression journey. Like even if nobody clicks on your ad, uh, if they end up on your customer customer journey, if they end up uh, being on your website, Hockey Stack was able to match them with your campaigns. Uh, and it was a game changer feature for Cognizant because Cognizant was heavily doing demand channel. Like it was a pure demand channel company and we were needing to see uh, the impression journey without the click journey because most of the ads were no click ads. Uh, and last year it was more about, okay, let's get perfect ad- attribution. So uh, they literally released every feature I needed at Cognizant. They released more features that I even imagined and every week there was a new feature uh, so like I was able to see not only which campaigns are bringing revenue but it was more like which campaigns are working to what extent and which campaigns are not working uh, because when you think about that every campaign has a return on investment to some extent uh, like even if you get to tender from a campaign there's a return on investment uh, but we need to understand if that campaign brings tender is there any campaign that is bringing trend dollars if so, how I need to allocate my budget. So as of uh, last year, it has become like an attribution 2.0 platform. But uh, with uh, this year, with the start of this year, actually uh, attribution has become one of our products. Uh, now uh, there's two other products. Uh, there's a sales intelligence platform where you can actually see the deal insights. Like you can see which deals need to be prioritized uh, by their previous actions, uh, which deals uh, you need to be uh, working or uh, working on, and uh, we are also doing ABM now. You can actually uh, create your account list, create your audiences right away at Cognizant by looking at your website data, attribution data, send that audiences directly to LinkedIn or display network, and uh, get that data back to your sales team and uh, enrich your website visitors. Like you can. Uh, identify your website visitors and uh, the companies visiting your website for the sales. So now we are actually building this unified platform where you can, now you can actually see the customer journey, not only the marketing touch points, but also sales touch points. So you can be like, okay, uh, the, apparently this LinkedIn campaign has influenced your uh, deal, but actually that deal got an outbound email or outbound call a month before. So like we can show you how each of sales and marketing touch points uh, had influenced that journey. And not only for close one deals, but also close loss deals. So like with one click, you can see what activities are causing close loss deals. For example, if there's a specific SDR that is causing close loss deals, if there's a specific campaign that is causing close loss deals, then you can add all of the filters you have in your CRM. Like you can be like, I want to see the close loss deals in enterprise segment in the US. Then you can understand if there's any activity that is bringing close those deals or that is influencing those journeys or vice versa, which has been a really interesting journey because uh, it is not only about showing what is working, but it is also showing what is not working. And uh, obviously the journey is not linear. It is a unified journey. So we need to take into account uh, the entire sales uh, touch points, marketing touch points, but also offline touch points. So like we can also do events, we can also do every offline touch point. And now we give you the entire uh, buying journey, the command center. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> def, um, there's a bunch of, I mean, would you say Hockey Stack then will become one of the main, um, you know, tools to get uh, the, you know, what's been uh, talked about as a unified GTM view, something that can help you uh, put together all of the different initiatives and motions uh, in your go-to-market strategy and identify what's working, what's not? Hundred uh, percent. That's why I'm trying to stay away from calling hockey stick as an attribution tool because when you say attribution tool, there are the companies. And for the last year, we have not lost one deal to a competitor because of the feature set. The only reason we are losing deals is the pricing. Uh, they they are like three x cheaper than us, and obviously we don't give that pricing. But for the last year, I swear to God, we did not lose one deal because of the feature set. The if we lose a deal, we know that it is because of pricing, uh, which has been an amazing feeling, to be fair. Like, uh, we are an attribution tool. We have the best product. And, like, everyone at Hockey Stick can just go on LinkedIn and say, we have the best product. We can write it. We can post about it. We can say it on webinars. But no other platform out there, they can say we are the best product. They say, oh, okay, we are partners with them. Uh, we have uh, been providing this. Uh, but they cannot say we are the best product which has been an amazing feeling. No, for sure. I mean, when you put on top all the, all the stuff that you mentioned, sales intelligence, attribution, and, and actually like giving clarity over such a messy buyer's journey that we're, that we're having these days. This podcast is brought to you by Founder Video. We'll cut your LinkedIn ads costs by at least 50% with natural looking creatives that prospects actually want to consume. Just have an expert in your C-suite show up to a 90-minute interview once a month and let us take care of the rest. Turn LinkedIn ads from an accepted line item expense into a scalable revenue channel that fits into your go-to-market strategy. Book a free consultation at foundervideo.io. Uh, do you think um, you know part of the reason why Dimension has become so popular is, of course, given to the change in buyer's journey? But um, do you think there's a misconception when talking about Dimension and Legion? How would you define each of them? Like, exactly. Sometimes marketers focus so much on semantics. Uh, and like I grew for, com I, I led the growth of four companies. Like I worked in a seed stage co company. I worked in series A, B, C, D. I built my own startup. I cashed out. Like I, I have been from zero million error to nine million error. And if I focus on semantics, I wouldn't have done shit. Uh, and I think uh, if you focus on semantics, it is more like you don't want to get your hands dirty and you just want to uh, make people think you are smarter than they are. Uh, like I feel like in order to show that you know your stuff, you want to be as simple as possible. And I'm just trying to simplify everything. Like, And when we talk about Dimension and Lichan, obviously there's tons of definitions. Uh, there's an influential of terms in B2B marketing because B2B marketers love that uh, other people think they are smart. No, like you, you don't need to do that. You only need to do your job. And if you get good numbers, if you grow companies, then it means that you are smart. Um, so yeah, for me, lead gen is when a company is measured by number of MQRs, the quantity of MQRs. So they have a lead target and they need to be hitting that target. It is not a pipeline target. Therefore, they have to maximize the number of leads. Therefore, they are focusing on uh, ebooks. They are focusing on webinars. So if a company is spending most of their budget to generate more MQRs, if uh, they spend more budget on generating the number of MQRs, uh, for any kind of way, and if they spend minimal budget for brand campaigns, if they spend minimal budget for uh, reach campaigns, it means that they are doing lead If a company is measured by the pipeline, if they are trying to focus on increasing the pipeline, then it means that uh, they they are focusing on demand chain. Like if a company is focusing on pipeline, if they run brand campaigns, if they run no click campaigns with most of their budget it means that that company is doing demand chain. Like, it is more like if they are measured by number of MQRs, if they are measured by pipeline. It is not the rocket science for me, uh, but yeah, I feel like there are so many people who are so focused on semantics, but yeah. No, that's a good explanation. I mean, 
putting the focus on on pipeline instead of leads, which you know at the end of the day means you gotta um, ver- like m- most likely not focus so much on leads and 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 take a look at what are the quality of those and downstream how do at what rate do they close and how fast right. Um, yeah, like talk ahead. about that. Uh, if you give me one million pipeline target for this month, and if I know that my ACV is fifty thousand dollars, I know that I need to generate two MQRs. Uh, I need to, I need to generate no, sorry, uh, I need to generate one million pipeline. Uh, and if my deal size is fifty k, I need to create twenty deals. So if I know that bring a qualitative MQL, we'll have like 50% uh, conversion rate. I can just focus my entire effort to generate 40 MQLs uh, because I would know that those will be very uh, high quality and those will be converting uh, with 50% conversion rate. And even though my cost per MQL will be like maybe $5,000, it wouldn't matter because I will hit my pipeline target. But if you tell me that I need to generate 200 MQLs, I'm not going to care about their conversion rate. I'm not going to care about uh, if they are going to convert better or if I'm not going to care about their HCV. I'm just going to focus on hitting my cost per MQL. Therefore, I can generate MQLs from smaller companies. I can generate MQLs from uh, different regions. Uh, and it will basically make you focus on the number, but it, it won't make you focus on the bigger picture. So marketing... What we're saying here, marketing needs to be measured on pipeline created, not on MQLs. I would say marketing needs to be measured on by pure revenue, not even pipeline. Not even pipeline. Like, not even pipeline, a pure revenue. Because like if your if your deals close faster, if the close rate is better, if they already know your product and if they move faster between stages, it is also the success of marketing. And I can generate you 1 million pipeline, but if that pipeline closes in three months uh, with like 20% close rate, is it a better pipeline than a 700K pipeline that closes in 30 days with a 50% conversion rate? Uh, I would prefer bringing 700K pipeline this month uh, and they, they will close this month with a 50% conversion rate, close rate, than bringing 1 million pipeline with 30% uh, close rate, which will be closed in two months. Like we need to be focusing on not only pipeline, we need to be focusing on revenue, we need to be, case- we need to be focusing on the cash flow, because again, we cannot commit to bring revenue three months later. We are all working startups. We need to be understanding our cash flow. We need to be understanding our burn rate. Like marketers need to be thinking like investors. They need to be thinking like CEOs. And it is not only pipeline. It is not even on about revenue. It is about cash flow. It is about sales cycle. It is about close race. Yeah, I like that. I like that what you said. Marketing marketers need to be thinking as CEOs need to, or or as CFOs even. Like we yeah. all because. It, the, 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 the need for putting the focus in efficiency is so high and, and so important that not only marketers, but the whole organization needs to be <laughs> thinking that way, of course. Uh, you published more than 16 reports since you're with Hockey Stack because, you know, one thing that I think is brilliant from you guys is that not only are you providing such a great product for, you know, let's not call it an attribution tool, but for go-to-market uh, analytics, um, but also you guys are taking on all of the data from the companies that you have as clients and then, you know, building industry insights, expertise, you know, and, and putting out thought leadership around what's happening in the B2B landscape from the data that you guys have uh, and analyzing it thoroughly. And you are the one publishing those reports. So I know one was, and, and I've read most of them, uh, and, and one of them was about the uh, difference between the management and, and, and legion which we were talking about right now, right? The, the need for putting the focus in pipeline conversion rates instead of form submission rates uh, as an example of the, you know, one of the usual metrics in performance marketing and pay. Uh, would you say this was one of the biggest insights? I'm assuming it is, right? From all of the reports that you published that people should uh, take away. But what are some other insights that you've seen across the data that you think are worth highlight- highlighting? Uh, I think one of the 
most important ones and one of the things that I liked the most was the marketing influence in outbound. Uh, so we analyzed the entire outbound pipeline and outbound revenue. And obviously every marketer deep down, they know that marketing campaigns influence outbound. But most of the time you can actually prove that. So we actually try to reverse engineer the outbound funnel in our customers and we look at this data. How many of those outbound deals uh, have been seeing as on LinkedIn in the last 30 days uh, and with a, at least five frequency? Like because you might have been seeing a network like one time, two times, but it doesn't mean that you will remember this. So like we use five there as a threshold uh, in the last 30 days. And uh, apparently at least uh, 21, I'm not really sure about that number, maybe 27, 27 of the total outbound deals were influenced by LinkedIn campaigns. Uh, and it was proving that, okay, marketing actually is not contributing to inbound pipeline, but it is also contributing to uh, outbound pipeline and outbound revenue. The other interesting thing that people love uh, is that the number of touch points required to close deals. So uh, how many touch points required uh, to generate an MQL, SQL, and close one deal? And uh, what we found out that in order to generate one website visit from your qualified deals, you need to be having uh, 723 impressions from that company. Uh, and it is actually a really helpful thing to consider because marketeers and even salespeople or CEOs and founders, they think that if you show your product, if you show your ad to the right person, they will see it right away. They will click on that right away. They will come to your website and they will come right away. Uh, but this report showed that it, it takes an average 723 impressions to generate one website visit and 54 touch points to generate one MQL. Uh, so it is not like, okay, you will see that. You will feel like, oh my God, I need that product. It will change my life and you comment. No, you need to be seeing that uh, at multiple times. You need to be coming to website multiple times especially if you're in b2b like you know that if even if you like a tool you if as soon as you submit that contact sales form it will take your time you need to first understand what is happening like you need to go to g2 to see reviews you need to be talking with your uh peers uh and you need to be first evaluating the competitors like once you submit that demo form there's a huge chance that you already evaluated the competitors. Like probably you uh, made a shortlist with three competitors because probably you won't be having eight calls with eight different competitors. Uh, so up until the journey, so like, okay, conversion is the last point of that MQL journey, but up until that part, there's a huge funnel that you need to be understanding. And obviously some call it dark social. And in order to uncover this dark social, social we actually release in the report, the state of revenue and attribution, which uh, we basically match the data from self-report attribution answers and uh, single touch attribution. Uh, and when we compared that data, there was actually 36% discrepancy of what attribution uh, was showing us versus what people were saying us. And uh, I think it is safe to assume that obviously there is a dark social which is being formed uh, through word of mouth uh, from uh, peers, colleagues, uh, but it is not that huge. It is 36%. Okay, 36% is huge, but it is still less than half of the entire journey. And uh, now we can actually put a number in it. Like, okay, there is a dark social. It is not as big as you think. It is like uh, one third of the entire conversions, yes. But it is not going to, like, if you don't understand that, it is not like you are going to go bankrupt. It is 36%. That's super interesting. Tell me about the methodology that you guys use for the reports. Because I know, uh, you know, one might um, argue that, I mean, you guys publish all of the methodologies, right? But, um, you know, um, there's... Probably someone doesn't know like how many data are you guys working with, how much data are you guys working with, what kind of data that you analyze, in which way do you analyze it. So uh, specifically for those ones um, that you mentioned, those reports, right, Dimension versus lead gen, um, then the uh, amount of touch points needed to generate an MQL, to generate a close one, whatever. What was the methodology there? What kind of data did you guys pull and, and why, most importantly? Yeah. Okay, uh, let me start with uh, sample descri description and sample size. Sample size changes every time, depends on uh, the reports. The reason being is that, for example, uh, for the state of revenue attribution, we had to get that data from companies that had self-reported attribution form on their uh, websites. 
And obviously, I would want to use all of my customers, but I only had 36 customers that had uh, self-report attribution on their websites. So my data set there was uh, more limited than others. But for, for example, Lichan versus Dimension, we had a data set of 150 customers. Today, we released uh, email marketing benchmarks and influence on revenue report just before this uh, webinar, just before this podcast. And uh, for that, we had a data set of 153 B2B SaaS companies. Uh, and although the data sample size changes, I try to use the same methodology uh, for the rest of the definitions. Like for me, MQLs are always uh, form submissions. Like it is not an ebook, it is not a webinar sign up, it is a pure form submission. It could be a contact sales submission, a pricing page, a demo submission. Uh, some people call them, I don't know, high intent submissions. Some people call them hand raisers. Again, I think there's an inflation of terms. I just call them MQL because for me, MQL means marketing qualified lead. And when you think of the definition of qualified, it means that they need to be sub submitting the form. Uh, and for ebook webinar, ebooks webinars, you can just use lead because they are not yet qualified. Uh, and yeah, I explained this methodology in the beginning of each report. And for lead gen, demand gen, uh, the, there was one additional methodology I used. And it was like how I define lead gen and how I define demand gen. And obviously, there's so many people who uh, love semantics, who are so focused on uh, big words. Uh, and yeah, I got some backlash from some of the people. And yeah, it happens. And I'm just used to it. And, and, but so how did you define dimension in, in Legion in that report? So, yeah, just like I mentioned, uh, demand jam means that if a company is spending more than uh, half of their budget on brand campaigns, it means that if they are spending most of their budget on brand, they're not measuring the number direct, they're not measuring the direct number of MQLs. But if a company is spending more than half of their budget, uh, for lead gen, for lead gen campaigns, for ebooks, webinars, it means that they are most likely measured on the number of MQLs. And we actually excluded the companies who were between. Like if a company was spending 45% lead gen and 65% uh, demand gen, we did not include any of those companies uh, because it, it would flow the data. So we need to try hard to understand the heavily, heavily demand gen co companies and heavily uh, lead gen companies. Uh, but yeah, obviously, uh, there are some people uh, who think this data methodology is wrong. But the problem is that it is really easy to say this is wrong. But what do you come up with? Do you come up with anything? Uh, like there are always uh, people who are uh, saying best about it. But it's like if you cannot provide a better data, if you cannot provide a better uh, research, then you shouldn't be crying about it. Right, exactly. I, I've always thought the same because honestly, I respect a lot of the people that uh, do reports with it. I'm not a data guy, right? I'm, I can I think it shows, but <laughs> I'm not I'm not technical. I don't I don't and and I think again, right? Like someone is taking the time to do the research, having that massive data set, and trying to come up with you know something that's closer to truth. There's no reason to to not uh, you know value that. I think. Yeah. And the thing is, like you might have opinions about it you might have ideas about it but if you really want to help that person you just dm them for example once we launched the first report it was my first report and i haven't written any content before in my entire life uh and we had a huge backlash because we didn't have a methodology because i thought explaining uh my definitions uh within the content would help like i was like okay now i'm looking at uh the definition of mq i'm looking at mqs and the way i define mqs is this like i was actually writing it within the paragraph but obviously if you don't read the entire content you don't understand my methodology and i wasn't aware of that so ashley ashley living from refine labs actually she dm'd me and she said uh a jump back is such a good report but i would have one feedback for you i think it would be more helpful if you put that methodology and yeah she was right uh and i think it was a really amazing feedback but also there were people uh, on LinkedIn, they were literally commenting under it uh, with like caps lock on saying that this is all flow. They are def defining it wrong. Now I'm like, you don't even read. Like if you have read the first paragraph, you would have actually learned about the definition. Uh, but they're like, oh my God, uh, I see the title. I see that number. It must be wrong. Yeah, but whatever. Also, social media. <laughs> yeah, like 
uh, don't get me wrong, like there are some people, especially like, for example, Chris Walker has been a huge hater, but whenever he uh, makes a comment about the lab reports, he's bringing us so many website visits. He's actually bringing us this. So I'm really thankful about him. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm really thankful that he's writing all of those uh, bad comments, all of those critic comments because each time he does that actually we are getting so many deals <laughs> yeah i mean i guess there's no such thing as bad publicity right as they say <laughs> uh <laughs> so let's talk about well there's a few things that i wanted to touch on um apart from so there's inbound led outbound and then i want to talk about the magic number as well in sas uh, but before, let's talk about what do you think most people get wrong about attribution, especially when it comes to LinkedIn ads? I think one thing uh, most people get wrong uh, would be the way they define attribution. Like uh, attribution has been a black box and obviously hockey stick and other attribution companies caused it like uh not now but before like all, all of the traditional attribution companies all of the traditional attribution like hockey stick tried to launch hockey stick 2.0 attribution 2.0 last year uh to make things uh more visible but for example we had a survey with 50 cmos early this year and we asked them what do you think when you hear the term of attribution and there was no one positive answer. All of them were like, it is flows. I don't understand how it works. I don't believe it. It is like uh, the promised land, but there was no one positive answer. Uh, because, yeah, like attribution has been a black box uh, because if you use multi-touch, you have no idea how it works. You have no idea how you get those numbers. The traditional platforms were actually keeping all of that data uh, on the back end. So if you click on that data, you were not able to see how much each of your campaigns were contributing uh, to that revenue. Uh, yeah, there's a huge confusion because it has been caused by attribution companies. Uh, because attribution companies had always been uh, really black box. And to be fair, we are seeing the same thing with intent data. Like, okay... Six Sense, Zoom Info, Bambora, they all provide intent data, but you have no idea how the intent data works. Okay, intent is high, but to what? Like, why it is high? You have no understanding. It was the same with attribution. Now we are trying to break that point, like, uh, especially with HockeySec. Uh, HockeySec shows exactly why the scores are high, why they are giving this number, why they are having this number. And we actually show them insights, like we show them explanations of uh, that data. But yeah, I think marketers are right because attribution companies, they did make everything hard uh, for marketers to understand. Because if marketers understood where that data was coming from, uh, they would probably, they would probably don't need that product because they would uh, just understand and uh, move forward. But it was a traditional attribution and this traditional attribution has nowhere to live in this modern world. How to transition to a more accurate uh, attribution model without having to pay for hockey stack if you'd have the money? <laughs> well, I would recommend, especially for LinkedIn, if you don't have if you don't have hockey stack, you don't need to have an attribution tool, but you can just do this. And there are some companies that are literally doing this and charging you uh, like a thousand dollar every month or like five hundred dollar every month or even like hundred dollar per month, but you don't need that. Just get Supermetrics basic license, which is like $40, $50 per month, connect it to your LinkedIn, connect it to your HubSpot, and use Google Data Studio. It is free. And just get the company level impression data from LinkedIn to GDS, get your pipeline data from HubSpot or Salesforce to GDS, put them next to each other, and compare which companies did you target in the last 90 days, which companies are you seeing on your pipeline. This will help you. And you can also filter by the number of impressions by company. You can also filter by number of engagement by company. So like you can literally do it at home by yourself uh, for like $50. Awesome. That's really good advice. Pretty actionable. We'll, we'll make a clip of that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely a good one. Um, okay. Now into inbound led outbound. I know you mentioned people are big on words and semantics. We don't want to be right. But there's a huge buzz on LinkedIn right now with this term. And I think it's sort of right. We've been talking about it as well. 
And 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 I think it's just a, a different way to talk about how we need to do outbound um, in this you know new era, so to speak, because of the um, you know uh, diminishing returns <laughs> that we've been getting with client rates and everything. Outbound is getting harder and harder and harder. You know, I've come. We we built our whole business around cold email, so now like we're seeing it's it's getting harder and harder with deliverability issues and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so my question is, what is inbound led outbound to you? How do you think of it? Uh, do you like is Hockey Stack doing something similar to this in their GTM approach? If so, how? Uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts. So I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, I, I mean, I'm more uh, inclined towards the positive side of it, but I don't believe that it's, it is a new term. It is another rebranded term uh, that has been probably out there for the last 10 years. Uh, inbound led outbound approach actually started with like, I don't know, Bambora uh, with Intent Data and the whole uh, the whole reason of those companies grew like uh, Sixth Sense, Bambora, Zoom Info was uh, the intent of it. They were like, okay, you will see the intent, uh, then you will uh, send the intent to your uh, outbound team, your STRs, and then they will be reaching out to these companies because these companies would be showing intent. But again, that intent data has been black box. It was third party intent data. I use Zoom for intent data. I use Bambor intent data. I use all of those uh, Aberdeen, uh, Discover, all of those intent data. All of them were flawed. Uh, the only intent data uh, that worked a bit better was G2 intent data. And when you think about it, it makes more sense because it is the first party data. And they are literally giving you uh, the companies who have been seeing your G2 page, who have been looking at your uh, G2 competitors. Like it is better data than all of the third party intent data. But again, it is a limited data because the number of companies visit your G2 profile page is limited. Like they are not uh, visiting your page every day. Uh, but like it is limited and it is not scalable. But with this new uh, inbound and outbound, it is more about uh, the website traffic, like understand who is visiting your website and approach them right away. And the problem with the previous inbound and outbound approach, it was about companies. And uh, like, obviously the outbound sales mostly happen in big companies. Like nobody hires an outbound STR to reach out to a company with 50 employees. Uh, but for a company with 500 employees or 5,000 employees, if you see that a company is visiting your website or showing intent, uh, you still have like, I don't know, 50 people to reach out or like 100 people to reach out from that company because they have no idea who is showing that intent. And that intent might as well be shown uh, from a different person, like maybe you are saying to salespeople, but uh, maybe a product manager uh, visit your website or visit your G2 page because they were just interested in your job post. Uh, maybe they just want to apply for your uh, company, uh, which was flawed. And yeah, it was a black box. But now with personal identification, uh, you can actually understand uh, who is visiting your website and you can directly approach them. Obviously, uh, it cannot happen in Europe due to GDPR, but in the US, I think uh, it's a really good way to approach outbound. Like, uh, because technically, when you think about it, outbound traditionally has been considered as sending email blast or like cold calling people uh, with like, tools like Orum, like you just uh, put like a CSV with 1,000 people and then Orum would call them automatically and you would just pick up and uh, take your chances without the intent. Obviously, was it working? It was working. Like for Cognizant, 50% of the pipeline was coming from outbound uh, and most of the STRs were call doing cold calls and cold outbound. But if you actually blend this data with uh, who is visiting, visiting your website, obviously the numbers will get higher. But again, this approach... Even though I think this approach uh, has a huge chance to work because, again, you can just filter by your ICP, then you can just send them to your CRM or your, your outreach and you will be sending emails or you'll be making cold calls. So it shows promise, but again, you need to be having so many people visiting your website. Like uh, if you have 50 outbound STRs and if, I don't know, 30 people, uh, third ICP are visiting your website every day, then it means that 20 of those STRs won't be getting uh, any leads uh, that day. Like inbound, let outbound is a good approach, but I don't think it will be only outbound approach. Like it, 
still needs to be uh, supported by the traditional outbound approach because or you need to have like, I don't know, a huge website traffic in order to make it work. Mm. Yeah, you need to be having a lot of hits to make it compensate. Yeah. Like if, if you want to do that as the only outbound, you better have like multiple daily hits, right? Um, and okay, do you think there are other uh, ways in which we'll be getting personal level identification to boost this inbound led outbound wave? Like especially first party data, because that I think is of course the best. There are some ways now with LinkedIn ads, you can get to the anonymize at the account level, but not at the personal level, unless they engage with you. We usually take that with clients, right? Like people that have engaged with ads, cause you can tell, right? Whenever mm -hmm. they comment or like, or whatever, people that have uh, viewed your profile and followed you from an ad, that type of stuff usually works well. It's not that hard to, to identify if they come from an ad or not, if you're on top of it, cause you can pretty much have a grip on what are you running as ad? What are, why are you not running an ad? And then, um, you know, if you get new engagers, of course, it's not going to be organic if the post is three months old, right? Yeah. So um, that I think it's it's one addition to inbound led outbound, but do you see any more? Uh, and how do you see the tech landscape evolving regarding So this? actually this is what uh, we launched a couple of weeks ago and I'm trying to not share speech here, but what we built now and what Hookstick is using right now for our own uh, sales playbook is that we are getting the data from G2, we are getting data from the other intent providers, like if you have Bambora, if you have Sixth Sense, we get uh, the website data, like we can also de-anonymize the website visitors now on the contact level, and we can just uh, match that data with your own goals. So like you can create your own account goal and you'll be like, okay, I'm measured by pipeline or I'm measured by revenue. So that uh, Hockeystack can reverse engineer that uh, to your intent points and to your website visitors and say, okay, now these accounts, even though they are not visiting your website, apparently they are showing intent according to six cents and that intent uh, is aligned with the other intent that actually brought to revenue. So you have to be focusing on this. So even though uh, that account is not on your website anymore or like hasn't visited your website anymore, we can uh, get the pieces together from Sixth Sense, from G2, from other platforms and be like, okay, you need to prioritize this account because they might be interested in your product. Uh, and the I think the point that needs to be focused on is the why, because there's a lot of companies who just show you the number, but uh, sales people need to understand why. Like you can just provide sales uh, with like 200 accounts and you can say that like, okay, 200 accounts are showing intent, but now we are trying to show why. Like their intent score is high because they did that, that, that. And then sales person can see it and they were like, okay, I think this is a good way, good, this is a good intent, so I'm going to reach out to him. Uh, I think this could be another approach uh, to be done. But apart from that, yeah, I think outbound still has place to live, even though code outbound, even uh, code emails, code calls. Although as soon as I see an outbound email, I Im immediately delete. Apparently, <laughs> like today, actually, we just launched this report. Outbound emails still bring like one, like the conversion rate to deals, it is like 1.1%. So like when you think about uh, with all of the deliverability problems and stuff, there's still 1.1% uh, opportunity rate. Again, like considering that uh, outbound emails can be personalized and if you actually create a good cadence, there's still uh, a huge opportunity there that can be used. So would you say that, you know, three or five years from now, there will still be a way in which you can sell only through outbound without having pretty much any content that's customer centric on the internet? I think it will evolve. Like now we have clay and technically you can just put the CSV there uh, and you can make clay to enrich that data. You can understand uh, a lot of data points from clay and you can make clay to write an email. Like you can connect clay to your uh, chat GPT API and you can make uh, chat GPT write an email uh, with all of those data points. And you can also train your chat GPT on your emails that work better in the past. So like outbound will not die, but it will heavily evolve. And maybe 
uh, this job now uh, being done by 10 SDRs will only be done by one SDR because it will heavily be automated and personalized uh, by AI. So yeah, outbound will still be there, but it will evolve too much. And I think it will even evolve more than marketing. Have you seen Mad Men? Uh, which one? The, ne- the newest one? This, the series, Mad Men. You know, uh, Pete, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I The other day I, was, I saw a post from uh, a guy called Jason. I forgot the last name. Founder at Erudit. Shout out him if you're listening to this. But uh, he mentioned how we're going to get a new wave of full stack, full cycle AEs, right? That are going to replace the SDR role uh, that will be selling like Pete, basically. Yeah. You know, sellers that are able to put out energy, expertise, and have connections and create, capture, and close their own demand, which is, I think, a figure of business development that that is missing a lot and yeah. that it's not part of the predictable revenue model, of course, right? Because it's harder to replicate, but I think it's the future of business development. So uh, do you think that's what we'll see moving forward, especially in outbound motions? And, 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 and do you think that will force anyone? Because for me, I think that's where we're heading. It's that everyone that wants to sell uh, in the future will need to be doing some sort of inbound yeah. efforts. They need to be putting out some sort of content, reports, videos, in whatever format, in whatever channel, in whichever form. But I, I think you're just going to have to do it, you know? Yeah, 100%. And... In terms of inbound, like it doesn't even need to be online. I was speaking with Emir the other day. Uh, I got an email from a company called Snatch, Snitch, an outbound email. It was the first outbound email I opened for a while. Uh, and the reason I opened that email was that while I was walking to the office here in SF, uh, I had been seeing their billboards. And I was already familiar. I had no idea what they were doing. But uh, while I was working, I was seeing those billboards. I was like okay, this sounds familiar. Let me open the email. And I was like, okay, now I understand. Like, uh, outbound will still live, but it doesn't mean that uh, it will stand alone by itself. It will still need to be supported by marketing. And it doesn't even need to be only online marketing. Okay, online marketing portion is increasing every year, but there will still be a huge play for offline marketing. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. Out of home advertising, right? This is, uh, not only billboards, but I think events can be rethought as well in B2B. Like you don't need to spend a million, two million, three million a year to get offline, like uh, results from offline efforts at events or trade show booths, whatever it is, it can be done more efficiently. And, and, and if you get the right person, it can, it can compound and, you know, get you the output that you used to get with five people in that event, most likely. Yeah, hundred percent. And now you can actually understand the actual impact of events. Like you can just upload the CC file of, uh, the people on the event or the company on the event, and then you can track their engagement levels. Like, uh, if they were showing, I don't know, three out of 10 engagement before the event. And now if they're showing seven out of 10 engagement, that means that event uh, has helped them to engage more. 100%. I mean, there's so many tools these days. I don't, <laughs> like you can do pretty much whatever you want to measure. Like that's, yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about it. Because, you know, what I knew about this, Tad, and also in your report as well, I mentioned it in the post. Uh, there's uh, in, the, in the report between dimension versus lead gen. Uh, even, even you know, imagine winning over Legion, the amount of revenue generated compared to the sales and marketing spend needed to to generate that amount of revenue was astonishing to me, you know, like, and I, I took a look at, you know, closer at the metrics and apparently I got the stat right here, the median magic number, uh, which by the way is net new ARR, I'm sure you know, but just for the people listening, net new ARR in current quarter uh, um, divided by sales and marketing spend in the previous quarter has been, 0.7x for public SaaS companies, meaning uh, this is from 2015 to 2021 on average, um, meaning you would put $1 in sales and marketing spend and the next quarter you would get uh, 70 cents, right, um, back. And has shrinked to 0.3x in the first quarter of 2023, right? Right now it might be even lower. I don't know, hopefully not, but... Um, my first question is you that you have been, you know, four times a growth leader in SaaS, B2B SaaS. How the heck did we end up here in the first place? <laughs> like how on earth 
SaaS software that is the most profitable business ever, or at least the revenue model is, or, or you know, was supposed to be, uh, how has it become so inefficient, right? And, and, and where we are heading and how, like, how are we getting out of this? In your view? Uh, simple answer, which is uh, like, unfortunately, between 2020, 2019 to 2021, uh, VCs had been really brutal. Like uh, they were giving the money and most of the VCs think that they could just, I don't know, like I saw a post uh, from Pavilion, uh, Sam Jacobs uh, from Pavilion a couple of days ago about the approach of VCs and which I also experienced from the first hand from multiple, in multiple companies. They were like, okay, in order to grow better, you need to hire uh, six AEs, uh, six enterprise AEs, and you need to give them one million quota. And even if they uh, attain 50% of the quota, you will add like five million revenue. Bullocks. Like, uh, it's like, okay, I have five fingers. And if I add five more fingers here, then I will have 10 fingers. No, it doesn't work. Or like, I don't know, I'm 12 years old now. And if I grow, uh, <laughs> like if I grow uh, for 12 more years, I will be like 144 years old. It is like that kind of math. And unfortunately, uh, there were so many VCs that uh, had this approach and it ruined the startups. Like uh, most of the startups went bankrupt. Most of the startups had to have a lot of layoffs. Uh, they are still having uh, layoffs because of unrealistic goals. Uh, because I also know how those numbers are being given by VCs. They're like, Okay, you had like uh, one, one uh, you had like uh, spent you had like five x return on investment uh, last year. Now this year you are going to have eleven x return on investment. Uh, I'm like, well, how do you do that? They're like, you have to find a way. Uh, like this is literally how all of those convos happening. And I can actually see it better now when I work in a YC company because the approach is completely different. Like in YC, it is like, okay, don't hire so fast. Uh, if you want, just don't hire anyone for three months. Don't hire anyone for five months unless you, until you find the one. Uh, like I'm reading a lot of articles about uh, other YC companies. For example, apparently in Airbnb, Brian Chesky didn't hire for someone for eight months. The reason being was that they just couldn't fire, couldn't hire the perfect fit. Uh, but uh, especially in that era, startups, had to hire a lot of people in order to grow. Like uh, if you are, I don't know, if you hire 20 sales people at the same time, they will be closing deals uh, faster. But no, because uh, if they are not fully ramped up, if they are not the right people, they won't be. And you end up paying them money, which will actually uh, shorten your uh Take, uh, it will uh, shorten your runway. Uh, it will make you burn more money and you won't be closing deals. So it was more like, VCs knew that it was unrealistic, but they also knew that if they had 10 portfolio companies, even if one of them makes it, they will make money out of it. Uh, like VCs were aware of that, but uh, unfortunately startups had to do that because they were uh, funded by those VCs. Those VCs were in the boards. Uh, so yeah, this is what has been happening. The return investment has been high uh, in those terms because everyone was basically spending money in order to grow. Uh, it was like grow for all of the cost. Uh, you can be, uh, yeah, you, you can be burning so much money, but if you are growing, that money is nothing. But it hasn't been the case. Like you need to grow efficiently. That has always been the case. Uh, but yeah, the VC approach back then, unfortunately, uh, wasn't, wasn't uh, helping this. Do you think the rule of 40 is a good metric to uh, project if, if, if a SaaS company is, is, you know, has a good health and like it's actually on the path to 100 million or whatever valuation? Uh, I'm more of a fan of 33222. Uh, uh, so if you grow 3x for one year and 3x for another year, so two years, 3x growth. And if you grow uh, 2x for one year, for the second year, for third year, so three x, two x growth for three years. There's a huge chance that you will reach hundred million error, and there's a huge chance that you are going to be a unicorn. So uh, three, three, two, two, two. Better than a rule of forty. I That's think it's easier. It's easier to uh, project that growth. Like 
and like yeah i think it is i would say yeah. obviously it is hard to grow like that but it is a easy it is an easier growth to project yeah and it is more accurate i think like if if you take the 33222 like for sure you're going to like you, you must be yeah. yeah but 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 my you know the thing is though like even if even in the rule of 40 and and and, and i think my my concern with SAS is this is like the focus is so much on uh, growth rates but you know what is growth if you're not profitable yeah right like what does it mean it's it's just more of a of a bad thing right uh, so I think the rule of 40 doesn't account for this too well because, yep. you know, the, the premise is that if your profit margin plus your revenue growth rate, it's uh, 40%, then you're going to get to 100 million ARR in eight years or less or whatever, right? But 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 really, it it's, it may not be like, I mean, you might get to 100 million ARR, but maybe those 100 million ARR means... Five million in, in negative, right? Like, and then 100%. where are we at, right? Like, so, um, what, do you think we'll, we'll see another wave of thousands and thousands of companies going out of business this year, twenty twenty four, as we've seen last year? And uh -huh. and what do you think? Like, how how are we gonna? Because I think part of the reason why SaaS has become so inefficient too is because of the barrier of entry. Now anyone can build a product, yep. right? And because of the influx of capital, the standards to promote it, to distribute it, has have been super high. And therefore, what used to be so profitable and so high margin and sexy like software, <laughs> because you need to put so much energy into distributing it and winning over your competition, then you're competing your all your profits away, just like Peter Thiel used to say, right? So, um, yeah, like what... What does a company need in order to win in this in this landscape? I think authenticity, like Paul Graham says, like if you have an authentic product, if you actually solve a problem like another company can, you will win. But your product and your solution will be authentic. Otherwise, like with each update ChatGPT has, it kills one thousand startups. Uh, therefore, okay, I'm. I think there will be a lot of uh, startups going out of business this year because all those startups uh, were built with AI, with built, uh, were built with ChatGPT APIs uh, within the last year. You can find AI for anything. But also, ChatGPT releases new features every month. And with each feature, those other companies will go out of business. And to fair, I think those companies are aware of that. They are just trying to make money before ChatGPT ruins them. And when I think about that, even not only software, the hardware, like the Rabbit, uh, the, the Rabbit hardware, uh, it was a product that was unfinished. They knew that uh, if they waited uh, longer, if they wait to ship a good product, they will have to compete with Apple. They will have to compete with Google. And uh, they tried to get the first mover advantage and they released a product that was unfinished uh, just to get some money. They were well aware of that fact. And uh, it is the same with software. Now, as I said, the entry barrier is so low, anyone can enter. And uh, anyone can use uh, ChatGPT APIs to uh, build their own startups. But if the startup is authentic, if they don't, if it is not authentic, and if they don't have any uh, unique uh, solution to a problem, they will go out of business. But I think if a startup is providing a unique approach, and if they are truly authentic in a way uh, for their ICP, uh, and if they are not funded by greedy VCs, they will be here. Hundred <laughs> percent. And last question for you, uh, because of you know, the massive success that hockey stack has gotten. And, you know, you, we didn't mention this, I think you mentioned it, but you, uh, doubled the uh, revenue in like 90 days as you came in. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's safe to safe to say that, you know, a thing or two about how to get <laughs> go to market fit. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, in this new era of efficiency, what do you think cannot be missed in the playbook for SaaS companies to achieve go-to-market fit? I think the most important thing is to reverse engineer your customer funnel. Like reverse engineer uh, the closed one deals and closed lost deals. Understand why you are losing to deals and why you are winning to deals. Obviously, everyone has a definition of ICP and uh, every ICP definition for everyone in the company might be different and probably are different. 
But if you truly reverse engineer your funnel and understand what is bringing your revenue and what is actually not bringing your revenue, you can optimize your campaigns, you can optimize your content, you can optimize your entire approach to that. For example, uh, I always thought uh, companies with 10,000 employees would be the perfect fit because they would spend more money, they would be buying the product, even though the uh, sales cycles would be longer, they, their ACV would be higher uh, because that, that's what I saw at Cognizant, that's what I saw at DeepCrawl. Uh, but uh, my approach has always been different for every company. Like I never had one playbook uh, that would uh, work with every company and I had to create a new playbook for each company. And with Hockey Stick, when I was reverse engineering the funnel, I realized that actually one of the deals that we were losing the most were the companies with more than 10,000 employees. And when I started to listen to all of those gong calls, it was because those companies actually already had a built-in product, uh, an attribution product. And uh, their teams were like, okay, we already have something internally, why you need a new tool? So although the marketing teams uh, on those companies, they really needed uh, a tool like HockeySec, they, they were getting blocked by their finance teams because they were like, we already have an attribution tool. Uh, so which actually helped us to understand who to not target and we start not spending any money on 10,000 employee and plus uh, companies, even though at first I thought it would be a really good enterprise ABM play. And similar to that, uh, I also seen out of uh, companies, uh, like I, I have seen out of patterns in the companies that getting that were getting closed, closed one uh, easily. And I updated, I optimized the campaign approach and content approach accordingly. But yeah, I think the rule of thumb, especially in the era of efficient growth, is to reverse engineer your funnel and understand what is working and what is not working. Love it. Great advice, man. Really great episode. It's been a pleasure to have you. Anything you would like to promote regarding Hockey Sack. By the way, I forgot to mention, you guys are giving away a Tesla. I don't know yeah. if that ended yet. So I'll let you, I'll let you shout out that. <laughs> Actually, uh, we are actually we are launching the contest next week, and yeah, it will go up until uh, September 30. And all you need to do is to uh, answer 15 questions on labsverse.hockeystack.com. Uh, you can also reach out uh, to it through hockeystack.com. And uh, the questions are all about the content we publish on the lab reports. So, like, literally, you can just open the lab reports on the second screen and uh, answer the questions. Uh, we don't care. We are just going to randomly pick someone among the people who uh, have the most uh, accurate answers. And we are going to give away a free Tesla for real. Awesome. We're recording this in June 4th in case you're listening. So this is going out uh, June, mid-June, somewhere around that, but you have until September 30th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. Okay, awesome. Good stuff. Well, been a pleasure to have you, as I said, and hopefully I uh, hope to have you back in uh, in the podcast sooner rather than later. For for those who don't yet follow Camber, go follow him on LinkedIn, uh, Camber Becker, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, man. It's a pleasure. We'll stay in touch. Thanks so much, Will. Awesome. Thank you for listening to the Founder Video Podcast with Will Martin, and we'll see you on the next episode.